Greetings from Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Scott Gardner, and I'm here today with Professor Oded Netzer for today's webinar, Using Textual Data for Business Insights. Before I introduce Professor Netzer, I'd like to just go over a few quick logistics. If you'll see on the next slide, a recording of this webinar will be sent to you. If you'd like to tweet about this webinar, please do so at hashtag CBSExecEd. And finally, most importantly, please submit those questions to the Q&A box and Oded and I will get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Oded Netzer. He is the Arthur J. Sandberg Professor of Business at Columbia Business School and affiliate of the Columbia Data Science Institute. His research centers on one of the major business challenges of the data-rich environment of the 21st century, developing quantitative methods that leverage data to gain a deeper understanding of customer behavior and guide organizational decisions. Professor Netzer frequently consults with Fortune 500 companies and entrepreneurial organizations on strategy, data-driven decision-making, marketing research, and extracting useful information from rich and thin data. He also works with Amazon as an Amazon scholar. And finally, he is the co-faculty director of the upcoming executive education program, Quantitative Intuition, running live online this January of 2021. Oded, it's great to be with you today. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for this very nice uh, introduction. And thank you all of you for uh, joining us uh, today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and thank you for joining us. And again, given this very nice introduction from Scott, I think if you want to describe me in one word, this is going to be a nerd. Two words, this, this is going to be a data nerd. So I'm the type of person that likes to look at data, hope that something would emerge out of the data. Sometimes I miss stuff in the data, other times I see stuff that is not there. And hopefully once in a while, I really see something that is really there. Um, and, and you know, as I was looking at this topic of data, uh, being an, again, an empirical researcher and a nerd, I went to Google and said, what does data look like? So I went to Google Images and put big data. And here's what I've learned. I've learned that first data are blue. I don't have a good explanation for it if anyone has intuition by data blue, I would be happy to hear. But the second thing I've learned was the data are a bunch of zeros and ones, which is kind of interesting because this is on Google, right? On Google, actually, data looks more like that, right? On Google, data more looks like a, a, a words and queries and a text, right? And in fact, good 80 to 95% of all usable information for business is in the form of unstructured data. Most of the data that is available to us is not in zeros and ones, as we see in the Google images, but actually more as text. And this is a topic that uh, really uh, fascinated me over the past a good 12 years I've been doing, uh, shifted a lot of my research from what is called a uh, structured data, data science around uh, numbers and so on, to working more with what is called unstructured data, be it text or uh, images or videos or uh, audio. Today, I want to talk particularly about text and some of the uh, challenges as well as opportunities that I see for companies in leveraging this uh, extremely rich and useful source of data, right? Uh, specifically textual data. If you think about textual data, it's really all over the place, right? Wherever you look, you see textual information, right? Whether it's reviews or social media, think about call service calls, uh, customer service calls, these tend to be more voice, but easily converted to text, so chats are already in text. Uh, whether it's through financial annual reports, news, or even more social type of uh, data, like movies or songs are textual. The problem is these data are quite rich and, and, and large, and it, very, it is very hard to get insights from them, or could be hard to get insights from them. How do we uh, see the forest for the trees? How do we actually extract insights as opposed to simply information from text. And again, this is a topic that has been um, one of my areas of, of interest, both in terms of teaching as well as in terms of research over the last um, decade or so, a little bit over a decade. One of the interesting things about text is that whenever there is a text, unlike often with numbers, numbers are often created, data that is more in numbers, sales and so on, are just created as, as, a, as a figure, right? With text, there is almost always a generator, a person who writes the text, 
and a recipient, a person who's, the, uh, who's supposed to read this text, right? And you can actually categorize the sources of data that is more textual data along these two dimensions. And I, I created a three by three, you can make it a, a bit more coarse because under society, I put both government as well as more a culture type data like, like songs and movies and so on. A lot of the work that we are seeing both in terms of academic research in the area as well as by companies is up here in this consumer to consumer cell. It's what we call UGC, user, user generated content. Consumers are generated content for other consumers to read. And, and to, be, to be honest, I think that one of the reasons why we see a lot of the work on textual data right here, on consumer to consumer, is looking under the street lamp. It's because it's the easiest data to, to identify, the easiest data to, to find, and, and, and that's why we analyze it, right? But I believe that actually a lot of opportunity lies in these other cells. For example, think about this, call centers. We spend billions of dollars sending messages to consumers. We call it advertising. And we pay attention to the font and to the background and to the image and to the celebs we hire and so on and so forth, right? And then the customer calls us back. Actually, the customer intends to talk to us, not us to the, the customer. And when, then, then what do we do with it? We send it offshore and we never want to listen to it. There is a huge opportunity in listening to something like call centers or chats thinking about financial reports and the underlying information that exists in these, reading them not just for the numbers in them, but actually for the what between the lines of um, why, why there were transitions in the company, why did the CEO or a CFO left the company and so on. All of this is useful information that actually we can leverage. And I'll again discuss some of these as we go through um, today's webinar. So my, my, my objective with this webinar is really to highlight the opportunity that exists in this source of data that is not new, textual data existed for ages, what did change is our ability to go and extract insights from it. I'll start by talking more generally about it and then I'll, I'll give you a few examples from work that I've done in this area, highlighting how businesses can leverage these, these sources of data. Another categorization you may want to put textual data in into is the categorization along the lines of, are we analyzing the text in order to reflect or, in, or, or to understand how text affects? Let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. When I look at um, reviews, if I analyze text of product reviews, I may want to use it to understand what does it reflect about the product? Does it tell me about specific problems, for example, with this product? I can understand the text and understand um, this product is very positive on these dimensions and maybe less positive on, on other dimensions. Alternatively, I can look at the same set of reviews in order to understand how do these affect consumers who are going to read these texts. Let's think about a call center conversation. I can mine the conversation in the call center to understand what does it reflect about the customer who was calling, meaning are they likely to leave the company, what does it reflect more about the, the situation of the company? People are complaining a lot about a particular problem that should be a flag for us. Or I can mine the same data of call center conversation to say, how did call center agents affected by the language they use, whether the customer decided to stay or not? So again, language, reflect, language effect depends on the problem that you're trying to solve or the problem that you're likely to address. This is a very busy slide and I will by no means do justice to it in the sense of going through the process of text, text analysis. Obviously within uh, our, our 30 minutes, uh, I will not educate you about how to do textual analysis. My goal is mainly to uh, give you a sense for those of you that are less familiar with what it is. And even for those of you who are more familiar with it, what are the opportunities that it, it brings to us? But I want just to highlight with these slides, what are the steps? What does it mean to analyze textual data? The first step, often underestimated in terms of time it takes, effort that it takes, is data pre-processing. It's getting the data to the point in which we can actually analyze it. Uh, people say that the data science is 85% data cleaning, 10% uh, data science, and 5% uh, creativity. And um, with textually maybe even more than 85 data cleaning and data preparation, because what we need is we need to get the, the words 
and, and we want to remove typical common words like the and so on. We want to solve spelling mistakes, maybe combine uh, verbs and so on. This step often takes quite a bit of time. Any graduate these days from any computer science, data science program is well skilled in doing any of these tasks. The next step is the data analysis. And here you want to ask yourself as you're going towards the data analysis, why am I analyzing the text? Am I analyzing the text in order to understand specific words? This is what is often called entity extraction. Am I analyzing in order to understand more topics, general topics that are being discussed, called topic modeling? Is it mainly to understand more positive or negative sentiment? Are people talking positively about my product or negatively about my product? Is it to understand relationship, for example, side effects that maybe a, a drug has? This is a relationship between the drug and side effects that we're mentioning with it. Or well, something is exactly at the level of the writing style. What can I learn about the writer, about their personality, about whether they are deceiving me or not, right? And these are often more related to writing style. And measurement, again, I'll, I'll skip that, but there are a bunch of, of, of ways to measure relationship between words. Uh, some of them are more technical than, than other. And, and finally, super important when you're analyzing text is to validate it, to make sure that you're leaving some text aside and ask yourself, how well am I doing? How well is the approach uh, doing? And one thing I want to highlight through my experience now, again, working with text for, for textual data for a good 12 years, uh, or maybe even, even longer than that, the best text miner out there, the best machine out there to read text still does not read at the level of a third grader. Uh, still third graders, a kid who's, nine-year-old, 10-year-old reads better than the best machine out there, despite what you may hear in different advances. On very specific tasks, machine can read better. But if you think more generally, humans still read better. So where is the value really of the machines? The value A is in the fact that um, machines can read much more text than we'll ever be able to do. Machine within a, a minute could read the entire history of the New York Times, which no human uh, can do, no, definitely not in this a level of, of a, a time. And second, the, 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 the field is developing. Machines may be able to learn uh, to read as well as humans. We are not there yet. We are, we are already at the level where machines can help us a lot. And again, particularly in aggregating large amount of information. But just to set the expectations right, machines at this point are, are reading reasonably, but not yet at the level of, the level of human. Humans are still the gold standard, by the way, for interpreting uh, text. Um, how are we doing it? What are the tools? I know this is often a question that comes up. These are actually two, the two most common tools that data scientists are using are Python and R. These are free uh, open, open platforms where, you can, where um, codes exist to, to, to analyze text. Unfortunately, they're not that uh, user friendly in the sense of a drop down menu. So you do need a little bit of familiarity with these. The good news is that, again, any graduate these days of a computer science or a, a, um, any data science program is well versed with these tools. So if you hire one of these uh, graduates or even intern, they would be well versed within, within these tools. There are several other tools that are more user friendly are also a, a for pay. This by no means uh, is a comprehensive list, but uh, Amazon has under the AWS, Amazon Comprehend, a rapid miner, one of the, the, the leading companies in this area, Luminoso, another one, who are providing more of a, a drop down menu, if you will, type of tools to, to extract information from text. I would even encourage you to think as simple as Wordles, right? As go to a Word Cloud type tool, plug in the text to there to get some insights if you want something really fast and, and, and simple. I want now to switch to maybe the, the second part, the remaining. A, 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 a few minutes we have to give you a few examples of how, how can one use text to, to maybe drive business decisions. And what we did in this paper is we took the entire sedan car forum and in, in, um, a, in, a, in a platform, right? A, we went to, on, on the web, went to a cars forum, downloaded the entire forum, very easy to do by the way. A, and then we looked for how often different cars appeared with one another on the forum. And we took it as a measure of competitiveness. And from that, we built the, the map that you see in front of you, which is a competitive map between cars based on how often they appeared with one another. 
The colors, if you are uh, wondering what they are, you kind of segmented the cars based on an algorithm, a segmentation algorithm, and found three big segments, which happen to be the compact car, the cars, the family cars, and more of the luxury cars in the, in the category. Very simple approach of just looking core currents of cars in a sentence, which means the customers care to compare, can give you competitive landscape in a fairly, fairly easy way. Another application, predicting loan default. We went to prosper.com, a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform where people give loans to one another. And we ask ourselves, can the, the, the words that people use, people wrote when they, when they apply for a loan, they wrote a short text voluntarily, why they, want, why they need the loan, maybe explaining a little bit their situation, and we ask, can we use these tags to predict whether they eventually the person would default or not on their, on their loan? Here's what we found. Um, we found that actually the word do help predict and over, above and beyond all of the typical financial type information. The writing style that people used was also informative. Here are the words that defaulters often used, words that we saw in defaulting loan, but not in uh, loans that, did, did, that were repaid. And we kind of put them, if you will, in, in, in word clouds where the size of the words, the larger the size, the more associated this word was with default, right? With a defaulting loans. We found that people talk about a lot about hardship and the hard financial situation, those who defaulted. And uh, they're, they're a difficult situation which eventually probably caused the default. But remember, this is predictive above and beyond things like FICO score and their credit score. Those who defaulted were super polite. Hello, thank you, God bless you, take care. They also expressed some desperation and plea, I need help, please help, um, uh, can you help me, and so on. They tend to explain a lot. Um, they tend to explain who they are, why they, they need the loan, um, maybe excuses more than explanation, but if someone explains a lot, that often was a sign of a default. They tend to refer to others. They tend to refer to their family, they tend to say often we as opposed to I. Um, the word God was twice as likely to appear in defaulted loan than it was in a repaid loan. So tend to refer again to, to, to others, which by the way, is a sign of, of a deception, has been found to be a sign of deception when people are deceiving. They tend to talk about others and not about themselves. They tend to say we as opposed to I. And so someone asked, what, what, what do I mean by writing style? That's writing style, saying more we than I or more I than we. It's less of the, about the content of the, of the text. It's much more about how we speak, right? Some people tend to say I, other people tend to say uh, we. They tend to use future, which is again a sign of a deception. Deceptive language is more future and present. Truth language is often tend to be much more past. And if you look at all of these together, right? What does it remind you? Uh, all of these word clouds, when I talk by the way to, to professors, they often say students that ask for a grade change, right? I mean, professor, I worked really hard. This is very important for me and you really need this. Let me explain all of the reasons why I, I didn't do well. Um, interestingly, if you look at the FTC, the formal name for it is the Nigerian email, email scam. So these e email scams that we receive uh, described as convincing sob stories, unfailingly polite language and promise for big payoff. Very similar, but a much more extreme version of what we saw in our loans. So by looking at these loans, we were able to identify whether these people will eventually repay or not repay their, their loans. I want to show you another example. This, this one comes from a collaboration we did with Airbnb and a pre their IPO. And um, what uh, Airbnb actually was, was um, asking was, can we keep hosts involved? Hosts are, are tend to be, uh, their lifespan tend to be fairly short. Can we understand which hosts tend to stay longer than others on the platform and uh, the profitability of different hosts? So what we did is we, we worked with Airbnb to put the following question on hosts when they logged in. Why did you start hosting? And then we use text analysis in order to extract the motivation of why people host. And, and what we found was that there were, there were three main motivations of why people host. One of them is totally the obvious one, the one that Airbnb had in mind as well. People do it to make money, right? I mean, you rent your, your place in order to earn cash. But there were two other motivations that were actually really interesting. One of them was meeting people. People did, and it was not in, inconsequential. 39% of the people had this motivation. 
um, to, to meet people from around the world. And the third one also around almost 30% of the people do it in order to share the beauty of their house. Uh, and now we ask, well, what is the profitability of these three uh, uh, groups that we identified from text analysis? So we, we took the textual data and put it together with data about behavior on Airbnb, about these activities of people on, on Airbnb. And what we found was that the three groups, motivation extracted from text, are really different also in their behavior on Airbnb. Actually, those who, the, the most common uh, target market that Airbnb was, was targeting, those, those who do it to earn cash, actually were less engaged, open for fewer nights a year. They, pricing was really interesting. Those who do it to meet people, they underprice because they do it just to, to meet people, right? They don't do it in order necessarily to make money. Those who did it to share beauty, they think they live in a palace, right? So they really uh, uh, overpriced. And retention rate, how long they stay around, Again, share beauty were the, the, the stickiest one, the one who tend to stay for a long, longer time. And you can probably already see where I'm heading with that. You take all of these three together, you can go straight into customer lifetime value. And we found that the share beauty and meet people actually were had higher customer lifetime value than those who did it to earn cash, suggesting to Airbnb that maybe there is another target market to go into. And, and the example I'm, I want to provide here is that Textual analysis allows us to extract these latent motivations, right? And when people write, they tend to express things that if you learn how to analyze the text, you can actually go and uh, uncover. Uh, very briefly, and then I want to open it to Q&A, uh, maybe the last example I will share. Uh, using text mining to identify, for example, a side effects, what is called in the professional language adverse drug reaction. We went to cases where the the, the FDA changed the label on, on drugs years after introduction of the drug to say there is a new side effect that was found. And what we did is we went back to forums where people write about the, the, uh, the conditions. Specifically, by the way, we were looking at, uh, one of the examples we were looking at statins and statin, there was a label change that it leads to co cognitive impairment. And what we found was that indeed there was high activity similar to the actual side effects or uh, adverse drug reactions that are on the label for, for statins for cognitive impairment. So we already identified a flag within the forums and discussions, people discussing um, statins talking about cognitive impairment type of language, right? Memory loss and, and other words that are related to cognitive impairment. More interestingly, the label change happened in 2011. We looked at the, at the forum and we had a timestamp for when people talked about it, right? Good eight years uh, before the, the label change, we already saw abnormal behavior with respect to mentioning cognitive impairment for statins. I mean, remember that, that, that the drug did not change, consumers did not change, right? Patients did not change. So really we were just able to identify the signal. Again, showing you how one could use textual analysis to identify events that actually were, were taken later and, and flagging these type of situations. So I wanna, I wanna um, kind of wrap up. First, here is a, a if you wanna learn more, uh, here is an article that we wrote around uh, how to leverage text for marketing insight or more generally, in fact, talks more than marketing to, about uh, business insights. And most data that you have there is unstructured. When you are facing a problem of dealing with text, ask yourself, who generated it, who is the audience, the recipient and the generator of the text, the, are we doing the analysis to understand text reflect or text affect? I only talked about text, but voice, audio, image, all of these are super interesting directions. Methodology is getting better, so we can actually go and analyze these as well. Um, social media is one source, but I do encourage you to think beyond social media, think about other sources. It's text is large, is messy, but it keeps coming in real time. And if you learn how to listen, there is a lot that can be done there. Uh, the, the hammer, the hammer of text analysis developed by AI and machine learning is keep imp keeps improving. It is our responsibility as, as business leaders to identify the right nails. And I don't think we have actually identified yet the best nails for this really improving hammer. And I encourage all of you and all of us to think about how can we leverage these really improving tools to address some of the business problems that uh, we all face? 
So with that, I want to um, thank you all for joining, uh, invite Scott back uh, and uh, opening it up for uh, Q&A. You can continue to upload your questions to the Q&A. We'll be monitoring those. So we have a, uh, we'll probably go a little few minutes later than noon, just because I want to get some of these good questions in, Odette. I hope that's okay with you. I'm going to okay. start with the first one that came in from Alberto. He said, besides topic modeling and sentiment analysis, what other analytical techniques do you suggest to start learning? Yeah, so um, I would say that, that even simply uh, extracting the words and, and, and seeing what words are out there, I think is, is very useful. If you think about the more, most advanced tools out there, and by the way, if you think about text, uh, um, maybe uh, um, referring back to Alberto's question, think about relation comparisons, right? We are not good at absolute. As humans, we are not good at absolute, but we are really good at comparison. So if I take, for example, let's say that I'm Apple, ask yourself which words are commonly mentioned with me, with Apple versus which words, just seeing which words are mentioned with you, probably gonna look obvious, right? People talk about iPhone, people will talk about uh, um, smartphones, but if you compare yourself to someone else and look at your top words versus Samsung top words, you, you will learn much more. So I encourage you to think in, in the world of text, think about relative, think about comparison of, of groups. The most advanced techniques out there, and one of the reasons why textual analysis is truly advancing in, in the last, I would say, five years, is that we go beyond these sentiment and, and, and text and, and, and a topic modeling to look at the context in which the word appeared, bringing in the, the context back to the, um, to it. These are, these are often called what is called, and again, apologies for the jargon, but word to vec or embedding, if you ever hear these words. This is the, I would say the most advanced. I'm not sure these are the places to start, but it's definitely the places to end is with these uh, type of techniques. Great, thank you. Some of these questions have common themes. So I'm gonna combine two for this one um, from Stefan and Angela. Basically on a company level, you know, how can we as an organization unlock the textual data that exists on these different platforms? And Angela followed it up with a little bit further, which is, you know, how do you make a case to gain access to that if your company is risk averse and heavily regulated? Yeah, great. I mean, these are great questions. So I would start internally, right? I mean, a lot of the data actually exists internally. A lot of the data exists on your, um, on your own, again, think about call center, right? Now, the, the, the difficulty is the, 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 sometimes the chicken and the egg with, uh, with, with dealing with sexual data is you want people to help you from outside because you may not have the skills inside, but you don't want to share the textual data because in order to share the textual data, you need to clean the, the private information, but in order to clean the private information, you need to explain skills. So um, to that extent, there, there are more and more broker type companies that do allow you to, to hash things and, and uh, allow you to explore it. I would start with internal data as well as with data that is publicly available. Again, think about financial reports. Uh, they exist out there. Getting these data is easy. They, they, what we, what we, where we are failing mostly is in gaining the insights from it. In terms of the first few steps and maybe also combining the two questions, particularly in the, in the current situation, the current economic situation, as I mentioned before, every student graduating this day from computer science, from uh, data science programs, are well versed and skilled with Python and R with these type of methods. So the barrier for entry is going down. Now there are some companies that even make it, make it easier for you uh, to, to gain access. And, 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 and more to regulators that say, oh, I mean, I mean, risk averse with respect to the data, part of the question you want to ask and, and pose to, to, to people who, who pose the risk on, the, on, the, on, the, um, on, the, on this textual data, are these data really riskier than the structured data that we are so much willing to analyze? And in many cases, the answer is no. Uh, the only reason we are is this, our historical reason that we haven't looked at this data. And, and, and again, the methodology was not up to snuff to, to allow us to do it, and now it is. So again, encourage you to, to um, take a, the small steps first, jumping into it. By the way, even starting again with something like word clouds, take the about us of your company, go to a word cloud, put it in a word cloud, take the about us of your competitor, put it in a word cloud and compare. Just by this very basic uh, text analysis, you, you are likely to learn already a lot. Great, great. A question just came in from Margaret. It says, when extracting insights and building predictive models based on writing style, 
How can someone control or account for potential biases from educational or cultural differences? Yeah, great question. So uh, to the extent you have this data, meaning if you do have data on education or, um, or, or, or difference, other, other cultural differences, you can put them in the model and see whether these exist above and beyond these, uh, these other variables. In many cases, for both legal and ethical reasons, actually, we don't want to put these into the model, right? Uh, in these cases, part of it is acknowledging that writing style, part of what it captures is uh, are, are maybe cultural differences. Just to give you an example, in the loan default uh, paper, we found that those who actually repaid tend to use more, more relative words. And relative words are often words associated with a higher education. So part of what the text allows us to capture are these type of differences. In terms of acting on these, one should acknowledge that often text does capture differences that are related to things like culture, things that you do not want to discriminate based on, for example, and, and, and use them actually to understand maybe even the differences between uh, groups that, that, that are culturally, racially, a gender or other, uh, or, or different in other ways. And then we do know the text does vary across these um, discriminatory uh, type of variables. So it's important variable to, to look at and, and understand these differences. Great. Uh, uh, Anonymous asks, how can we merge textual data with numerical data in order to use text in quantitative analyses, such as regressions, cluster analysis, et cetera? Yeah, so for example, what we did with the, uh, the example I provided before with the loans did exactly that. So we took all of this text, we either put it as actual um, set of words in a machine learning model where I have zeros and ones for the words. Together with it, I had data on the amount of the loan requested, the credit score of the customer. So a bunch of these traditional structure variables and run it in my predictive model. Alternatively, the, the problem with that is that you have a lot of variables, thousands of words and so on. If you use something like topic modeling, if you, if you reduce the number of observations, if you will, to the topics being discussed, now maybe I have only 10, 15 topics plus another 10, 15 uh, variables that are more structured, and I simply can put it into any typical statistical method to, to combine the two. But I do encourage you actually to do exactly that, uh, whoever mentioned these comments, and um, do put in or think about combining your textual data with your structured data. Don't think about it as a whole different analysis. Combine the two, it's often where a lot of the value uh, comes from. So it's a great question and, and suggestion. Okay, um, so I'll ask uh, one more question from uh, a member of the audience, and then I'm gonna ask one final question for myself. So this last question comes from Nidhi. What about privacy issues when we're trying to mine insights from customer conversations on social media? Do we need to be cognizant of that? Definitely, uh, uh, definitely in the sense that, that uh, on the one hand, there, there is this um, ambiguity about social media, right? Because if I put it out there, I actually put it out there on social media for everybody to read. Does that mean that it is allowed to be used by the company in a more uh, in, in, in a more commercial way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, first, some websites do have uh, restrictions about it, and I do encourage you to pay attention to actually what are the restrictions, legal restrictions first. There is, a legal, there is a legal aspect and then there is an ethical aspect, right? Uh, at least on the legal part, definitely make sure that you understand the legal aspects. On the ethical parts of it, um, one of the good news, by the way, about social media is that rarely it is, we know often we don't know much about the person. The data often comes fairly anonymous unless you are you're part of the company, of the social media company itself. When I go, for example, to forums, I don't know who the people are. I'm actually just aggregating the data and, th and in that sense, most cases, there is no problem with it. If you're using individuals, there is definitely an ethical issue with that, right? With extracting this without a provisions of saying, I'm going to use the data, for example, in order to, to target you, which to be honest, most social media companies already do. So it's not that Facebook and Google of the world do not mine your text, they do. Your Gmail is being a, a constantly a text mining, in a text mine way re already read by, by companies like Google. But definitely in transfer of these sources of data, one needs to be uh, very careful and transparent whenever this is, is being done. If you aggregate the information as, as in many cases, like the example I showed with the cars, I see less of an issue because there is very little information at the, at the individual level. Okay, great. Well, you know, this is a, one of the last questions I ask 
most of the professors I work with on these webinars, and I, I'm going to ask it to you too, to get this to, you know, the people that have tuned in today to keep that momentum going, to keep the excitement going of all this great information. What today, tomorrow, Monday, what is the first thing they can do to start thinking in this mindset? So the, the first thing, by the way, is don't start from data, start from problems. Ask yourself what problems am I facing and then how data, it's something we talked a lot about, uh, about in the quantitative intuition uh, program that we teach. Start with the, the, the problem, ask what, what sources of data can help with these. And then to get yourself up to speed, start even again, as I mentioned before, just with a word cloud or just with uh, putting the data into a way that I can, I can visualize it, you can uh, um, climb faster up the learning curve by either, again, hiring one of these interns from uh, one of these data science uh, programs or computer science, or collaborate with one of these companies like Rapid Miner or, or Illuminosos that would allow you to actually give them the data, they'll give you back an image that tells you the connections between words, the, the, the flags that may come up um, in your data. But again, I encourage you not to go fully exploratory, pick the problem that is sitting on your desk, take a piece of data and just plot it. And when I say plot it in the case of text, the easiest way to plot it is, is again a word cloud and see what it tells you. In my experience, whenever I do it, I already find something interesting and then I need to dig in deeper. That's when I go and, and bring in my heavy power uh, tools with, with my data scientists to better understand the problem. That's great. Yeah, I love that. Find the problem first that will be your North Star towards finding the data. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Odette. It's so great to see you. We haven't seen each other in person in a long time, so it's great to see you virtually. And uh, on behalf of Columbia Business School, Executive Education, Professor Netzer, myself, thank you all for joining us today, and we wish you health and well-being. We'll see you again in the new year, 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, and always great to collaborate with you. And thank you to all of you for joining the webinar and for these wonderful uh, questions. Um, again, have, have a happy holidays and happy new year. Thank you.